two, one. Cool. And I am live with Alex. Well, we're not live recording. We'll be live. But Alex, I'm very, very happy to be with you here today. How are you, my friend? Dude, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm glad to be live in two days or whenever it goes live. <laughs> right, right. I'm going to try and load it up today. I'm going to try and load it today. So, uh, so I, I, I usually do a level set with like, when did we meet? How did we meet? I think it was me probably stalking you on Twitter or something to that effect or Medium, right? I think uh, I was inspired yeah, by I, some of your writing recently. Yeah, I saw, I saw you follow one of my things. And I actually, you know, Medium sends you the uh, like a notice on who follows you. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and I saw your one and I saw your little description. So there was a blurb. I was like, oh, this guy looks interesting. I clicked on you. Uh, I, you know, just saw a bit of your background, saw your website and everything. I thought, okay, this is worth while us uh, getting in contact. So yeah, it was interesting. kind of you, me, and here we are. Here we are, here we are, here we are. So as I was just telling you kind of pre, pre hitting the record button, I was saying that, you know, I, I always believe that, um, you know, Bitcoin ones and zeros, super fascinating, taking it back, changed my life, changed people's lives. But what I'm kind of obsessed with, I'm like on episode number 72 now, is really capturing the stories of the people, right, that are that are choosing to build on Bitcoin. Because to mm. me, ultimately, that's kind of what it comes down to. And I feel like no one's really capturing that um and so yeah so so again as someone who's you know written you know the the rise of the individual which uh, i've read now a few times which i, I gotta admit gives me the heebie-jeebies gives me some they, my, they make the hair on the back of my my next uh, stand up but it's like holy shit there's like this guy's like a brother from another mother type of deal so let's let, let's go okay so the, where does your story begin uh yeah and let's let's turn it over to you all right. Um, I guess where, where could I go with this one that I haven't gone before? So, so I think my story really begins maybe with my dad. Let, let, let's go there. Let's let's start. My, my dad being like a tough, uh, you know, immigrant basically to Australia. So, so you know, you may have experienced the same sort of thing with your parents uh, coming. Maybe did, did, were you born in America? Or were you born in uh, India? Canada. Yeah, it was a similar oh, type of deal. My parents came from India. Hey, Alex, by the way, okay, is there okay. a little there bit of yep. delay on your there side? You hey, Alex, there is a little there... bit of a delay, yeah. There is. Is it, do you, is it showing on my... Uh, let me just pause it real quick. Let's go. Okay, we're back. Sweet. So, uh, yeah, you, like I said, you've probably experienced coming to Canada. Oh, sorry, be, being born in Canada, but to, to immigrant parents. I was born to immigrant parents from Eastern Europe. And, you know, my, my dad sort of... You know what immigrant parents are like sort of they, they come from a crappy country they come to you know the land of the free or whatever it is uh, america us australia something like that and then you know be, because they had to work like a shit job and sort of you know climb out of the sludge they they kind of uh i guess project all of the things that they wanted to be uh, onto the kids you know so my dad kind of you know he, he used to sort of pump into our heads you know you've got to be either a movie star, uh, music, a musician, or a, or a soccer player. That was his sort of three things, you know, and he used to beat the shit out of us, you know, to make sure that, you know, we, we were good at it. <laughs> and um, so, so, so there was that, and it was also just sort of his push in, in the academic forum. So like he always to, to be good at school. Like, I mean, I knew my 12 times tables by the time I started kindergarten and, you know, kids were still learning to count. So, so I was always sort of like, you know, I guess ahead of the curve. Now it, it you know, it might sound like some good out, you know, outcomes and, and, you know, I genuinely am thankful that my dad was hard on us, but, you know, w when you're experiencing it, when you're at the other side of the, you know, the, the parent child tyranny, you know, at the time it feels quite brutal, you know, cause you come back without like an A grade from school and you cop a mad backhand to the face. Uh, and then, you know, you gotta, you gotta go back to work. So I think my dad from a young age, inadvertently instilled like a maybe like an essence of excellence in me you know it's some sort of you know drive to to so-called succeed or the way he used to put it his phraseology was uh, you can't you cannot be another number um, and that was the kind of thing that he tried to drill in our heads is like you know if you're another number you're just going to live a shit life you're going to be a nobody basically it was his thing just that you, you know you have to make something of yourself so, so he was really I guess adamant about that. And 
Now, you know, me, me and my dad don't really have a great relationship now. Like, you know, ever since I moved out of home when I was sort of mid teens, you know, my, mine and his relationship fell apart and we sort of, did, you know, haven't spoken much. But being older now, I can appreciate those sort of early formative years in terms of the, the essence that he instilled with, in me. Now, fast forwarding to sort of my mid teens, my, my next major, I guess, influence in my life was my uncle. Uh, and, and my uncle was, he, he was my dad's brother. Uh, and I moved out to go live with him because he was, he was much more of a father figure in the sense that he, he, he genuinely sort of uh, was supportive in the sense, not, not in a softly, softly sense, but in an inspirational sense. So, you know, he, he was a bit of a philosopher and a historian. He had messed around with politics and stuff like that. And he, he was quite anti-establishment. He wanted to go back to Macedonia and do some things in the country and all this sort of stuff. So he sort of, you know, really planted the seeds of, you know, more my dad was more about like excellence, striving and success. My, my uncle planted the seeds of more like greatness and striving for something, you know, greater than yourself. And, and that was another significant seed, I think, for me is because, you know, I, I, I not only was, uh, you know, I guess in part thanks to my dad, a kind of a, a driven individual, uh, but you know, with my uncle, I, I felt like I was sort of purpose driven and mission driven in some sense. And anyway, I, mm -hmm. me and my uncle also had some, you know, disputes in my early twenties, but I, I went to university. I felt that university was quite a lackluster environment for me because I don't know, I was doing engineering. I I'd been given a scholarship and the people around me were really just, uh, I don't know. They, 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 were, they were there, but they weren't there. You know, I'd, I'd ask someone, why are you doing engineering? And they're like, eh, I don't know. I've got nothing better to do. And it's like, really? Like, you're going to spend the rest of your life potentially doing this. And you're doing it just because you've got nothing better to do. Like, yeah. I, I just felt so, I was like, what, a, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, it just, just felt like weird. So anyway, me being the driven maniac that I was, I kind of, wanted to you know excel and advance and prove prove something whatever i wanted to prove at the time I, ha I had this sort of vision in my head when i was 18 to become a millionaire by the time i was 20. Uh, I, I should also add two other in interesting influences was mm. i i had i had read two books when i was 15 16 that kind of also so i think plant early seeds one was rich dad poor dad uh kiyosaki which everyone should know uh and then the other one was i think the guy's name was uh, Joseph Campbell or something. I can't remember. It was it was an old book called Power of the Subconscious Mind. So it was one of those sort of first books on. It's sort of been bastardized in the modern days, like you know, since The Secret and all that bullshit came out. But this was sort of written back in I think the eighties or something. So it was it was it was genuinely good, and it it helped unlock some things in my mind that I guess, despite my uncle planting seeds of greatness, he it was sort of limited to this. Uh, incessant, uh, you know, drive towards patriotism around our country and doing something great there, uh, as opposed to something, you know, larger. So these things kind of locked me in the, and the metaphor that I used to use was I was swimming in a river and then I was, you know, drowning in a sea. Like there was just, you know, my mind got unlocked. And, you know, then I think some other interesting inspirations to me early on were people like, if you're familiar with David Blaine's Angel, the sort of the, the street performers that, you can call them magicians, but they, they sort of push the boundaries of what's possible uh, with respect to human endurance and things like that. So I was quite inspired by those guys too. So anyway, left home, had this thing. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 20. So I took my scholarship money and instead of buying textbooks and paying my way through uni, I put it all on the stock market. And my goal was to make a million bucks derivatives. So it all stuff good you know i was trading options and warrants effectively in the early days of the online broking and i you know i managed to turn three four grand into almost fifty thousand. i thought i was king shit i thought i was a genius i was like yep by the time i'm 20 i'll be retired <laughs> anyway 2007 kind of gave me the wake up call so a couple of weeks before my birthday 
I had placed a series of trades, which if they went my way, I may not have become a millionaire, but I probably would have been worth close to a quarter of a mil, somewhere in that region. And anyway, I think about a week before my birthday, everything went sour. And I can't remember if it was like Bear Stearns falling over or, or one of those sort of like pre-GFC tremors. But the market got like wiped on one of the days and because I was levered up, my option down 70, 80, 90%. And I remember waking up that morning and just sort of looking at the screen and I'm like, you know, trying to refresh the screen, thinking there's something wrong. You know, I'm looking at my account balance and it's down 90%. I was like, what in the flying fuck have I done? And it, it was a funny experience because like I, I started walking around the room and I'm like, fuck, 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 fuck. And I, and I kicked the hole in the, um, in the kitchen bench. I'm like, oh shit, now I've got to clean that. I've got to fix that. So it was just like... <laughs> this kind of panic, you know, set in and I was like, you know, what have I done? I've just destroyed everything. I've lost everything. And in my infinite stupidity, I uh, decided to lever up further. Um, I had some assets in my name that were effectively not really my assets. They were sort of uh, family assets, but I managed to pull out a bunch of loans against those. And I kind of dug in trying to trade my way out of the hole. Anyway, within five, six months, uh, I was about a quarter of a million in debt. So I went the opposite <clears throat> way. Okay. So yeah, there are, when most 20 year olds start their twenties square, I was starting from minus 250, which was a, which was, I think my first real independent trial by fire. That's the way I like to frame it is that, you know, most people, I think, and it was funny, like I'd, I'd go to a friend, you know, he'd be sort of panicking, he's like, fuck man, I've got to go to $500 credit card, I'm stressing out. And I was like, well, here's a bill from one bank for $92,000. Here's a bill from another bank for $60,000. He'd be like, what the fuck? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> okay. And yeah, I had to, I had to make the choice to leave university. And I needed to make some money fast. So the first thing I could get my hand to do was door-to-door -door sales. And that was, I mean, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And I mean, if you know me now, I like through my writing or podcasting or speak, you know, they, they presume that I'm an extrovert, but I'm fundamentally not an extrovert. I'm a trained extrovert. Like I, I'm introverted by nature. I enjoy my quiet time when I was younger during those sort of uh you know earlier years particularly in university man i was shy so i had no friends i spent my time basically reading and training and studying and trading the markets and all that sort of stuff so picture that sort of personality like you know i'm, I'm not autistic but maybe somewhere towards that spectrum so it was like really hard for me to go out now and start knocking on doors selling pay television uh you know which a I didn't believe in TV. I didn't have pay television, and, but I needed to fucking eat and I needed to pay these bills. So uh, I was, yeah, the next sort of six, seven months of my life was getting up in the morning, going to the gym, uh, going to the office, uh, training people how to sell, then going out and knocking on doors for eight, nine hours, getting told to fuck off uh, by you know strangers until you make a few sales. It was a commission only job. And then at nighttime, coming back home and reading about markets and economics and trying to figure out how the fuck did I get things so wrong? Like, how did I lose so badly? And yeah, going to starting the cycle again, it was just this sort of real like struggle. And the interesting thing is, and this is where I say, you know, necessity is kind of not only the mother of all invention, but it's sort of the, the mother of all progress is that I had to eat. So like, I, I, and I remember this, I, my, my, I had daily rations for food. So I'd, I'd, you know, I'd have four cans of tuna, two in each pocket, and I would only eat if I got a sale. So I'd like be sprinting between houses, knocking on doors. If I got a sale, I'd sit down and I'd eat a can of tuna and then I'd you know, get on with the job. So like I was really strict with my food. Each can of tuna was a dollar. So like my, my daily, you know, subsistence was $4 a day. Like, so everything was sort of like structured so that I could dig myself out of this hole. Uh, it was wild. Fascinating. <clears throat> and yeah. So I, um, those early years really, I think, you know, forced me to like, I think the commission only piece 
taught me that there's no guarantees in life that you know if, if you don't produce a result you don't get paid and i think for me from an entrepreneurial perspective perspective that was extraordinarily important because that gave me the ability later to build businesses and venture into the unknown because that's what people misinterpret about entrepreneurs like i hate all these crazy academics who sit there and they sort of like point it on as a business owner it's like oh they got it easy you know good for them they they just get to like boss other people around it's like no 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 you you don't fucking know what it's like to have zero guarantee of feeding yourself or your family tomorrow to have zero guarantee that everything you've invested in this may like produce something or blow up in your face and you end up with nothing like that level of risk and sacrifice is something that unless you've been in business you just can't uh, empathize with it you, you you can't appreciate how important that is so Anyway, I think that sort of early experience is really important for me. I then proceeded to set up my own sales company and I also oh, what I was saying earlier was even though I was selling something I didn't like and I wasn't an extrovert, I became one of the best sales people in the country for pay television because I just learned to communicate directly with people. So I didn't I didn't follow any any of their traditional sort of uh, sales tactics and like, you know, hard closes and all the bullshit. I created my own method, which employed, which was really inspired by people like Tony Robbins and Richard Bandler and all these guys who, you know, they, they use, you know, neurolinguistics, like real organic communication with other human beings. I employed that sort of strategy at the door. And it, and it was crazy, man. Like my, my results were way better. I'd knock on 20 doors, get four sales. The average person would knock on a hundred doors to get one sale. So like, I just had much better conversion rate and I, I, I really learned, I honed in my capacity for communication, my ability to communicate effectively. I really honed in during that period. So I went on to sort of found my own sales company with a business partner who, you know, we did well originally. That's sort of how I dug myself out of the original shit. And then he, uh, basically me and him had a disagreement about how the business should be run. He wanted to sort of Sort of cut everyone's sales fees and all he was just sort of being a greedy prick and i was like man that's not how we're gonna run the business we're gonna lose all our best people so we had this sort of blow up he left i kept running the business for a little bit but i ended up having to close it down because i got my first kind of lesson in business beyond sales was he was bankrupt so he didn't have any any ownership in the business liability so he wasn't the director i was uh, when he left, we split the money 50 50, but then when it time to like pay taxes and the liabilities and all that sort of stuff, uh, we, we didn't split it properly. So I rang him up. I'm like, dude, uh, we need to pay this bill. And he's like, uh, well, that's your problem now. I've already got my money. So I kind of ended up having to sort of pay everything down and tie it all off. So I had to start from scratch again. So it was a pain in the ass, but it was a good sort of early lesson in business, which is, you know, structure your, your down, like, Manage the downside risk and then that you know, liabilities, how liability functions and all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, I went on from that, built a uh, solar renewable energy. And that was, I would say, my first major, I think, success. That was where I made my first mill. What year uh, are we in now? Um, uh, we're, we're in now 2012, I believe. Somewhere around there. So 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. And, and... I had, I'd, I'd never left the markets. So, you know, I think my, my incessant need to understand where I went wrong inspired me to, I guess, I didn't really do enough Austrian economics, but I went down the rabbit hole with the sort of the Max Kleisers and the Mark Favors and all of those guys of the world, like the Gerald Salentes and all the jobs, like the Golden Center space. And I actually, I, I got into gold until really early and, and I made a shitload of money out of that. It was, um, it was, yeah, 2011, 2012, like I, me and my brother, we rode that bull market all the way up and, you know, we, we sort of did, I think a thousand percent return in, in six to eight months or something like that. So it was, it was a, it was an interesting thing. And alongside that, I was, you know, running the solar company. I started building a gym, all this sort of stuff. And then I got what I call my next major lesson, formative lesson in life, which was don't trust the government. 
And effectively, the, 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 the short version of the story of what happened was I was installing through our business uh, basically mini solar systems on people's houses. So anywhere between 1.5 to say up to 10 kilowatts. And you would install that on a person's house. And then the government had a bunch of rebates associated with it, right? So they would give the people kickbacks. Now, the way the kickbacks worked was that they went directly to the to the business. Now, now this was all good and well. And th- this is why I'm such a skeptic of any government uh, intervention these days, is that even if it's not some stupid conspiracy to try and uh, attest power, like even if it's got a good intention behind it, they royally, royally, royally fuck up everything they put their fingers in, right? So this intention was to stimulate the growth of the renewable energy sector in Australia and to sort of, you know, drive some sort of, uh, you know, energy stability. And good idea, ridiculous execution. So because they uh, applied the rebate at the level of the consumer, what it did was it incentivized all of these fucking cowboy businesses to pop up out of nowhere. Like before the rebates, there was like me and one other company that were doing solar in the whole region. In the, in the, there was about 45, like I'm talking monkeys who've never, you know, (laughs) wired a hot wheels car together, uh, climbing up on people's roofs and putting solar panels and advising them that, Oh, uh, you know, like there's a massive mansion and they've got this little system that's enough to power a fucking toaster. Um, just because there was a there was a maximum re get on, you know, a specific size system. So it's like on this thing, like I saw Australia, the, the the panel, like we're on the southern hemisphere, so panels are supposed to go on the north roof. Like I'd go to houses, panels are on the south roof. So this guy's losing 80% of the potential capacity to, you know, power. It's like the dumbest crap. So Anyway, what ended up happening was the government had this sort of plan to run the rebate for five years or whatever the time was. They ran out of money in like eight months uh, because, you know, everyone went apeshit. And, you know, they they last minute, they were like, oh, you know, we're cutting it short. We've had, you know, excessive demand and all this sort of crap. So they basically stimulated the industry and then they completely deflated and crashed the entire industry. And the ramifications of that was the way the rebates got paid, they were tied to these things called renewable energy certificates. And as a company, we claimed these certificates when we installed a system, and then we had to sell them on the market. But through the, through the run um, that we had towards that, the, um, the amount of renewable energy that came on the market crashed the price of the renewable energy certificates. And effectively the rebate that we got as the business to offset the cost of the installation crashed by 50, 70%. So to give you the math basically is if we were to do a, a standard house, which was say 10 grand, the customer would pay five and you know, the renewable energy certificates at the time would have been worth about five grand. And, you know, maybe on a job of 10 grand, we'd make 15% profit, right? So, you know, $1,500. We'd get the money from the customer up front, but we'd have to wait. We'd have to apply for the certificates later. And what happened, obviously, with the things crashing, was all of us in the industry who thought we'd made a shitload of money really we actually lost money every single system because of the, you know, the, the, the skewing that the government with their stupid fingers uh, came in. So anyway, I got my next major lesson, which is don't do any business with government because you know, no matter what, like there was a bunch of people in the solar industry that had been around for years and they were all, like, oh, let's do a class action. Let's sue the government. I'm like, man, who are you going to sue? Like they make the rules. They're going to decree on the rules anyway. So it's sort of like, it's such a, like a dumb notion. And I was like, man, we, we're all like, we, we just got burnt. So let's move on to something else. And, and that was, you know, it's formative things. So like the, the pursuit of excellence, you know, the, the, the desire for growth, the, um, the, the sales thing and sort of having my back against the wall and not having, you know, anyone to sort of support this idea of uh, produce to earn and not, none of this like fixed wage stuff. And then this, you know, uh, experience that I had with the solar company and all alongside sort of just having my finger on the pulse of the markets and, 
being involved in the gold and silver market and stuff like that. I think all of that really formed the miss for me to later, I founded a couple of tech companies. Uh, one of them, I did a small exit. The other one kind of forced out. I got what I call Steve Jobbed out of my own company. So the board and me had a disagreement on how things should be run. So I stepped down. We kind of got forced out more than stepped down. And then they ended up running company into the ground. And like all of these sort of experiences then sort of landed me in 2016 into Bitcoin uh, as I was looking for what to do next. And yeah, like the way Bitcoin came across my radar was I'd heard about it back in the gold and silver days from, I don't, I don't know, there was Max Kaiser jumping up and down on a couch or some something. Um, and like I saw it again, I was like, holy shit, this thing's like five, $600 now. I was like, man, last time I saw it, it was like in the, in the double digits. Like what the fuck did I miss here? And, you know, that sort of inspired me to start digging. And the more I dug, you know, with, with these sorts of seed that had been planted in the past five, six, seven, eight years of my life, I think it just aligned on so many for me that it's honestly like when people say, you know, if you can't find something to live for, find something to die for. For me, like Bitcoin just represents such a raison d'etre for me. Like this next chapter of my life is like purely focused on enabling Bitcoin and seeing it as a for, you know, for, for, for progress uh, in the world. Like that, that's sort of my raison d'etre and, and Amber has become my entrepreneurial expression my writing is sort of my poetic expression and my thing and all this sort of stuff that i do is sort of my artist expression but all of my broader vision or my broader mission of trying to get bitcoin you know as doing my part to bootstrap it so yeah that's an attempt at my story <laughs> that's crazy alex that, that's wonderful Hey, Alex, I was just going to, I didn't want to interrupt at all. So I, I'm, I'm going to do one more thing here real quick, if you don't mind. I'm going to go, I'm going to pause it. And I'm going to switch back to my other internet just to see if it helped because it is still a little choppy. Okay. I want to just uh, try it. Give me one sec. One. So all yeah, right. I was going to ask you, uh, um, Alex, uh, you know, as we kind of switch gears now into your Bitcoin story, if you will, uh, and how you decided to build on it and, and bootstrap uh, your business and bring it to life. Yeah, just wondering if you if you don't mind commenting a bit on uh, on this article that you posted on your uh, on your Twitter feed called The Rise of the Individual, you know, just to give people a bit of context. Uh, the first couple words is a quote from Murray Rothbard saying, uh, well, the fall of the state, uh, the greatest danger to the state is independent intellectual criticism so it's a powerful statement so just curious like what what kind of inspired you when you wrote this and and yeah what, what were you kind of going with this article for our viewers yeah it was it was an interesting time for me because i mean as you can see the, the, the publishing date of the article was uh, new year's eve on 2019 so you can sort of see what i do in my spare time <laughs> so you know people are out partying on new year's eve and here i am publishing an article on medium um, so I'm still a, I'm still a, you know, nerd introvert at heart, despite my, you know, seemingly outgoing personality, but the, I, you know, 29, the end of 2019 was a really interesting time for me because I, I don't know, something, Bitcoin had started to radicalize me and, and I started to, I guess, discover, I started to question the the illusory nature of a lot of the mandates that are decreed by the state and i i, I really started to you know like because you know as you get into bitcoin you start to question you know the, i mean the first and most fundamental question is why should the state be able to print money like you know wait a minute like what what, what why you know, why do they get to print money, but I don't like, you know, so you start to question these things. It's also, you know, one of the other illusions is this, uh, uh, you know, oh, inflation, great, 2% inflation. Like, so and we don't question that. We're like, really? Like, what? why is that a good thing? You know, th there's, because someone said so, like, you know, what, what, what relationship does that have to the actual function of society so so bitcoin kind of makes you start to question these things and 
And around that time, I think there was a bit of talk about, you know, the book, The Sovereign Individual. And I just started, like, I think I read the, the opening to that book. And, but the, the book that kind of inspired this was actually a, a really short one called uh, Anatomy of the State by Murray Rothbard. And I, and I believe this is what, uh, I don't know, one of the opening quotes, or, but, but it's somewhere in that little book. It's like a little tiny book. It's like, it's a one day read, um, but it, it's in there. And that to me just sort of rung true is because the, the, the state's ability to, to exist, you know, really depends upon the conformity of the individual and the, you know, the, the renunciation of personal agency and the desire to be a part of the collective. And in order to do so, you know, you, you need to set aside any ability to criticize and you need to try and, you know, basically conform as one of the cogs in the chain. And, and so the state relies on transforming people into a form of cattle, basically, so that it's, you know, that they're much easier to manage. So, so, and I don't like to use the word control, it sort of implies conspiracy theories and lizard people and all this sort of strange shit. So, you know, I, I, you know I'm not a, I don't like to subscribe to conspiracy theories because they're, they're, they're much too simple an explanation for a lot of the stupidity that happens in the world. But, 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 I, I recognize the, the very real existence of a, you know, of a desire by the state to more easily manage their subjects. And if you can dumb people down, like I hate public schooling is, you know, I, I don't call it schooling. Like it's, First of all, it's the furthest thing from an education possible. Uh, you know, it, it'd be a mild, mild uh, criticism to call it schooling because schooling is like a lot of people don't realize there's a difference between education and schooling. Education is what you get through life. Schooling is what somebody sort of drums into you, right? Um, and schooling could be educational, but it may not be, right? Now, the state schooling is actually even further removed from schooling. I call state schooling basically state indoctrination uh, it's it's a you know it's it's a form of uh, camp that you basically when you're young and impressionable as a human being you know as a young kid who's you know got interests and stuff and you know has some sort of individual personality you basically get shoved into this sausage machine you get almost all of the individuality out of you <laughs> for 12 years um, and then you sort of then you know they get thrown out on the other as another sausage to join the ranks of sausages in the corporate world. So it's like, you know, this, you, you, you know, intellectualism gets beaten out of you in these state indoctrination camps, uh, which we know as schools. And I don't know, that, that thing rung true for me. And, and I think the other part that inspired this was just my, coming to terms with Bitcoin as a force for the re-emergence of sovereign individual, you know, a, a, a person who can not only own his thoughts, but own his wealth and own his private property or his or her, whatever, you know, you want to identify yourself as these days. But that kind of, you know, focal central piece of the puzzle like the ability to have your wealth you know protected not by um a pro promise of the state but through the you know through the implicit and explicit guarantee of cryptography to me just started like really blowing my mind around that period so so i had to write this piece is that you know the the way the world is going is collectivism is this sort of like parasitic disease that feeds on the individuals uh, in a society. And, you know, you end up getting the situation where you have a few people that are part of the parasitic cohort. And that is effectively at you know, the state, the central bankers, the bureaucrats and all that sort of stuff. Then you have sort of like a 
two other types of people in society. You have the, the producers and the consumers by and large. Now everyone is a producer and a consumer in some sense, but I'm talking more about net producers, net consumers is a net producer, someone like an entrepreneur, they create excess value and that excess is generally in profit because, you know, they've done something good for society that others are willing to buy their product and service for. Right. But then what you have is the state goes and, you know, basically at gunpoint says, give us half your money that you made um, and we will distribute it to everyone else here who hasn't actually added any value. And that has a really perverse effect on societies because if you're a producer, like you then start to question the validity of why the fuck am I working so hard when, you know, someone's just come and taking half my shit. Why don't I just be like the dude down the road who's not doing anything and he's just given stuff for free for doing nothing. So it really starts to create this, like it erodes the productive capacity of society and it enlarges the parasitic or consumptory uh, as aspect of society. And, and, and this is sort of, you know, part of the degeneration of what we've seen in the West and, you know, like the, the countries that our parents came to, which was supposedly plans, are starting to decay now, whether it's Canada, whether it's Australia, whether it's America, like all these places are starting to decay because the parasite that is the state, it can't feed off the people that produce nothing because there's nothing to feed off. So it feeds off an ever eroding, uh, you know, producer base that is effectively, you know, the middle class and sort of the upper middle class because we, we produce all the shit, right? And, you know, we just sort of get chipped away at, chipped away at, chipped away at to the point where we either give up and we join the with a sludge uh, or we um, decide to effectively be slaves. We, we are indentured serfs forever. And Bitcoin kind of has the ability to break that for the first time ever. And I just find that so... So extraordinarily and incredibly powerful that yeah I, I just had to like I I remember writing this and it was just you know stuff coming out of me man and I was like fuck the, you know I was really really inspired so like when you tell me that it it gives you goosebumps like that I, that makes me really because that was the intent when I wrote it I wanted this to charge people um, and I think it's doing its thing. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate that. Hey, Alex, and, and then I guess to go back to your kind of your story in terms of how it now, like, I guess, how, so you have all this like experience, you have all these ideas, these thoughts, but how do you make a mark in Bitcoin? Um, you know, just kind of shifting gears towards, I guess, you know, uh, Amber and, and I guess the emergence of, you know, like, how do you build something in this space, you know, given kind of the uncertainties and all the question marks around it? Uh, how did you come to that? I think important. see a lot of people come into the Bitcoin space and what they try and do is they try and fit Bitcoin into their own box. And when they realize that they can't do that, they end up going down the shitcoin path. That, that, that's effectively the story of what happens. And, and what's really important, I think, to understand with Bitcoin is that this is a monetary revolution, like any monetary revolution. It's a social revolution. This is going to change the, the very base incentives of society and how the world actually functions. Now that kind of change doesn't happen overnight. This isn't a fucking another TikTok app or another, you know, widget for your, you know, for your computer. Like th th this is a fundamental groundbreaking change. It's going to take decades to emerge. So what happens is people generally come in, they try and fit Bitcoin to their own thing. Bitcoin doesn't work. It's emerging as an asset it's emerging as a money like and, and in order to emerge as a money it needs to emerge firstly as a collectible then it has as an asset as a store of value then as a medium exchange so this, this sort of takes time it takes a lot of, of time it takes more time than what average entrepreneur tech entrepreneur is willing to invest in their next little startup right so the first thing you have to do to build a business in around bitcoin is to understand where is bitcoin in its journey like one of the best early products for Bitcoin was Silk Road, hands down. Like it, uh, it used Bitcoin's uncensorable, uh, uncensorability as a medium of exchange. 
for people to buy stuff online that the state would not allow them to buy in real life. It was a fucking fantastic product. Now, has Bitcoin um, changed from there? Has it matured? To a large degree, yes. But is it still the best uh, medium of exchange to use from a from the true nature of what medium exchange means? You know, the inability to censor someone's right to swap or trade with body. Bitcoin still is, and that's why it's still used on most of the darknet markets as a primary currency, even though it's not as private, supposedly, as something like Monero. So, so Bitcoin has that has that element. But if we move aside from the medium of exchange function of Bitcoin, then what's the next piece? Well, Bitcoin is the only uninflatable fixed supply money that exists. So, in that, you know, what 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 benefit does that have? Market? Well, people who are uh, privy or savvy enough to understand that you know inflation is not a good thing that their that their purchasing power is being eroded every year that the amount of money being created by central banks and governments is unprecedented i mean in you know last year 25% of all of the money the us has ever had got created out of thin air like you know if there's ever there's ever you know a, for evidence just look behind you. Like you don't have to go back that far to realize how how much you know. I guess shenanigans are happening in the world. So if that's the, if that's the need that Bitcoin is solving at this point, then you know you need to ask yourself as an entrepreneur, what, how can I build a product to solve the friction that this need is trying to you know that that this solution that is Bitcoin uh, that the need it's trying to solve. Well. The easiest thing is an exchange or a brokerage app. You know, some way to help people swap dollars into Bitcoin, help this exodus occur. And, and that's exactly how I kind of viewed this. I sort of looked at Bitcoin and I said, well, you know, I'm not going to build some, you know, payments app or not like people like this. The phase that we're in now is capital allocation to Bitcoin. There is there needs to be a flight to Bitcoin. And this like when I first set up Amber, I believe that flight was going to take 10 years or 20 years. I think that flight to Bitcoin is going to be contracted now with how crazy the world is at the moment, because I think more and more people are going to freak the fuck out that um, not only is their purchasing power being decimated, like if you look at the like people think asset putting up, that's not what's happening. It's the purchasing power, like all of that excess capital, where it's going, where is it going? It's going straight into these assets. And then it is, I mean, you could say asset prices are going up or the purchasing power of the, the, the unit through which you buy those assets is going down. Either way you look at it, like in relative terms, you're getting decimated out there. Um, so what people are going to need, not just want, but need, is a place to store their wealth that is not going to be eroded, that is not going to be taxed, that is not going to be inflated, that is not going to be confiscated. Solutions? No, we don't. So I looked at it that way and I said, I need to build a product that helps enable that exodus. Like, you know, I've always viewed Amber as a bridge between the old world and the new world. And the old world is burning down and there's people looking for the bridge and they want to escape to get to the new thing. Um, and at some point we're going to have to chop that bridge down. Uh, but while we're here, before that entire old world is completely burnt down, Amber will be one of those bridges. There's other bridges, but I want to make the strongest, safest, you know, easiest to cross bridge possible so that people can get out of the old financial system and move into Bitcoin. Now, what we do with it thereafter, that the sky's the limit. Like, I don't know. Like, we didn't know in the early days what we were going to figure out with the internet. I mean, you know, in the early original idea behind the internet was voice calls. And we can barely even get that fucking right today. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, the internet kind of, <laughs> the internet spawned everything else from cat videos to TikTok to fucking shit that we never would have imagined. But that's the nature of, a zero to one innovation, like I know you're going to mention Peter Thiel later, but a zero to one innovation is something that is created that is unlike anything that existed before. Bitcoin is that zero to one, and as we as we migrate onto it, what will the you know the new generation of society, finance, banking, and everything look like? I'm not 100% certain, 
but I know it's going to be more sound and it's going to be to, in reality, not, you know, the fucking funny money bullshit that the central governments uh, make up today. So, so that I think it's really important to, if I was to sum all of that up, I would say, understand that the Bitcoin cycle longer than what you might want to do with your business. Don't try and squeeze, you know, Bitcoin into your business model, but apply your business model, uh, find the best business model to apply to the stage of Bitcoin uh, and where it is in its, in its cycle, in its life cycle, um, and then build that. And that's effectively where we are today. And unfortunately, despite what I say here, most people will still go out and build some sort of shit coin and some sort of app can try and like, you know, do things on their terms and they're just going to, either wreck themselves or wreck the people who have decided to follow them, which is unfortunate. You can't save everyone. hundred percent, man. I couldn't agree more. Um, I like that, by the way, I like that analogy as well. The bridge, right? You're creating like the safest, most sound bridge for, for people to kind of just get over to the new world. Uh, I, I like that, man. Um, and it's and it's purposeful and you know purpose driven, which I like as well because there's a lot of projects in this space. You know, I would say maybe to some extent Ethereum included, uh, don't they don't stand for something, and that really gives me you know we can talk about oh you can't verify the the number of Ethereum and it's not you know deflationary oh they did the DAO and on and on. But to me fundamentally, it comes down to the fact that you know philosophically speaking, they don't they don't stand for something. In fact, I wrote a blog about it recently, which you know, Vitalik's dad commented on as well. And he agreed with me is, is that, 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 that's probably it's, you know, it's, it's greatest opportunity and, and threat, you know, and most likely I, I still haven't seen that, that, that be addressed. Um, whereas with, with Bitcoin, I love when I speak to Bitcoiners, when I talk about Bitcoin, I get charged up. It's not like an intellectual yeah, thing. It's not like yeah, a, yeah. it's not a math thing only. It's like a heart thing, which, which I think is very fascinating. I don't think a lot of people get that. Um, yeah, but yeah, sorry, sorry, but Alex, okay, so Amber, um, I think we've, 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 we've that, that's beautiful, by the way, and uh, we're going to share the domain and all that later, but just just because people might be super interested at this point, what, what is the domain? Is it Amber dot? Amber dot app. That's it. Dot Amber app, dot perfect. App. And it's available on iOS and Android, or, or is it only on iOS? iOS and Android. iOS Wait. and Android in Australia only at the moment, and US in uh, hopefully March, the latest April. And is there, there's no wallet component, is that correct? Like, is there a wallet component or is there not a wallet? Meaning like, do people have no. to buy a hardware, like something like a cold card or a Trezor or something to, to get the Bitcoin or is it, uh, do you have? We, 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 yeah, we, we encourage, we encourage everyone to self custody, obviously, but because we're like the, the way we've positioned and built Amber is like sort of people's first foray into Bitcoin. So as a result, most people don't have any concept of hard wallets and self-custody and stuff like that so what we do is we do uh collaborative custody multi-sig with um with unchained capital and in doing so we uh we effectively abstract best practice to our users and then in the process we also tell people Sick. like look as you start to accumulate some bitcoin get with self-custody and withdraw it out like that that's you will on the Bitcoin network yourself, as opposed to a third party like us. Now we're a good place to start, but definitely the journey is about educating people to, to you know, get out to that point. I also wanted to mention something what you said earlier about sort of Ethereum and it, you know it missing the the charge, the emotional mission sort of drivenness that Bitcoin has. And I think, you know, it's most evident. I think you know. I mean, how many iterations has Ethereum gone through? First, it was a world fucking computer. Then it was something else, and then it was like a you know. A ICO Ponzi scheme fucking platform. Now it's and, and like for me, it's like DeFi represents for me like the the epitome of the reinvention of the old world. It's like let's take all the fucking stupid financial engineering that we're doing on Wall Street and the existing world, and let's just do it programmatically on some so-called blockchain. Like, what kind of innovation is that? That's just taking gambling from one place and doing it on another place which is fundamentally even fragile than the old system and and for me it's like that doesn't that doesn't juice me there, there's nothing interesting to me like you know someone talks to me about DeFi. i'm like what the fuck are you talking about like there's no that's like literally redoing like so bitcoin tr is sitting there trying to break down like and like i said it's, it's this whole new world here 
And it says, let's do away with the fucking old. Let's reinvent from first principles. Whereas Ethereum says, okay, let's take this, but let's make it programmatic. It's like the, the, the problem is the old system. It's not that the old system is not digital because most of the old fucking system is digital anyway. So just putting it on an Ethereum blockchain, making it slower is not doing any service to anybody on the face of the planet. It's such a, I, I find it so like shallow. And that's why like, like I, I resonate with your comment that it's, it's completely missing a raison d'etre. Like it doesn't have a reason for existence other than effectively moving gambling away from Wall Street and into Main Street, which is, doesn't add any value to society. Like it doesn't do anything. So, yeah, yeah. Alex, the other thing I wanted to say quickly is, uh, yeah. is that, you know, with, with, uh, like, if you think about money, money is one half of every transaction. <laughs> That's a big fucking deal, right? Like, uh, uh, like if you want to manifest freedom on earth, um, you know, tackling money with like a laser focus is crucial. And so, Yes, the fact that I think I actually like I, I've known Vitalik and these guys because I'm from Toronto since two years before he even I think uh, you know launched the project and 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 I never took part in the ICO because of the same feelings that I, I harbored today, which is this this you know um, I don't know it's just, it's just, it just it never really like got to me emotionally um, mainly because it mm. felt like it was a, a pet project um like a, a lego like, like the way i look at my xbox for example like i, I don't mind it like i don't have any ill feelings i'll, I'll sign on every now and then and then tinker with it but is it going to change the world for me fundamentally is it going to free me and my family and you know um no i i don't fundamentally think so i think i think it's it's cute that, that that's kind of the word i would probably uh, use to describe it and cute's not bad <laughs> interesting I, I, that's a, that's a... cute i think that's what i think of when i think of italic little kitties cats you know it's cute <laughs> it's a very it's a very good point actually it's funny just before i jumped on this call with you i was speaking to some guy who reached out and wanted to do some writing for us at amber and we started talking about like uh you know, how bitcoin's necessities becoming more and more prevalent and particularly with the with the introduction of central bank digital currencies right and and I think CBDCs uh, represent a significant threat to freedom for the individual and freedom for society in general is that, you know, I would argue, you know, we all talk about freedom of speech as the basis that, you know, what, you know, free societies are built on freedom of speech. Now, my argument would be that freedom is, of speech is not just about what you say, it's about what you can do. So like I, you know, I have a saying, which is don't tell me what you believe, show me your bank account and I'll tell you what you believe. And, and that is, I think, fundamentally true because human action determines what you believe. Human action is the fundamental form of free of speech. And, and human action is effectively uh, economic action that like, you know, when you look at what natural economics is, it's, it's, it's the study of praxeology. Praxeology is human action. It's, you know, where do you choose to allocate your time, your energy, your resources. That's effectively speech at its very most fundamental level. Now, if that that stuff, that money, that speech can be called by a central authority, like a central bank, through a digital currency, where they can dictate what and where you can spend your money and how and why, man, that's a dangerous world to live in. And Bitcoin is literally the only thing left that stands in the way of that. Like, what are we going to do post, you know, flakes of gold to each other around the world? It's like, it, it ain't going to work, man. Like gold is finished. It's done. It's over. Like, you know, the, and each government is going to slowly abolish ta uh, cash. So cash is gone. So what are you left with? Like it's, it's coin. So, so it's, it's a free world with Bitcoin or it's a, it's a or when dystopian nightmare with central bank digital currencies. Take your pick. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I agree. I, I, I don't agree. know I, what simpler way I can put it for people. The former prime minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, last week said that he can see Bitcoin being put on our central bank balance sheet.
that would me th that would be the first point at which I would look at my Canadian dollars or CBDC and see a little bit of value in it. If it was actually like if I knew that it was ten percent of it was backed by Bitcoin or some shit, ooh, sign me up. But other than that, I agree. And and I and then it is a bit of a red herring, I think. And then it is draconian. The thing I like about CBDCs is that I also think it'll be a great on ramp. To Bitcoin, because once you've got people playing and this and that, it'll just be like a little switch on Amber and just boop, you've got your Bitcoin and you know, and you're just like, you, you can, it'll be like a, it's like almost, it's like the whole blockchain thing, you know, it's like, it's like a red herring, like the banks kind of grabbed it, like the blockchain you is going to change yeah, the world. You would hope so. <laughs> you, you would hope so. And un, un, unless, uh, like, I would say that the, um, the danger there though, is that they could really simply just make it impossible to convert your CBDCs to Bitcoin. Um, so, so that'd be very hard current money, but it'd be very easy with CBDCs. So, so I, like, whilst I agree with you, I think there is a, there's a True. very real danger of them just ha having a blanket ban because they can programmatically uh, set in the CBDC what it can, what you can acquire with it. And, you know, if, Bitcoin's on the blacklist, then you, you can't, no matter what you try it, you can't do it on any application. So that I think is quite- And, and the truth, they don't need, they don't even need CBDCs to do that. Like if you look at FATF and the travel rule, they're, they're trying to come down on the coin bases of the world already, um, you know. They're trying to, but it's a lot harder at the moment. And that's why I think mm. CBDCs, you know, whilst, you know, in, in some senses will, you know, might make the initial friction to swap from, you know, government currencies to Bitcoin easier. It also does make the capacity to clamp down on it very, 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 very easy. Like it's just the line of code. Whereas now they have to go through legislation hmm. where, where it is that like things to try and good clamp point. it later on CBDCs, it'll be very easy. Yeah, good point. That's okay. So to, to get to my, I guess, the contrarian belief question. So what is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin may or would disagree with you on? Hmm. It's probably two. I don't know which one to pick here. Uh, so we got a little bit of time. <laughs> we... One of these, yeah. One of them, I guess, maybe I'll start here, is my actual answer to that question, so not in the Bitcoin space, but just in general, is actually Bitcoin. So if someone questions is something that you believe in that very few people agree with you on, that Bitcoin is going to change the world or Bitcoin will be the money of the future. And and it's it's such a contrarian bet. Like I wrote a mini article a couple of years ago. I think it was a year or whatever ago saying uh, Bitcoin is the ultimate contrarian bet because uh, in the in the normal world, people laugh at you with Bitcoin. In blockchain, people laugh at you with Bitcoin. In crypto, people laugh at you about Bitcoin. In you know uh, central banks, they laugh at you about Bitcoin. Like everyone laughs at you about Bitcoin, but it's the only one that is rooted in first principles. So it is the actual ultimate contrarian bet, right? It's ultimate, 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 ultimate. So, so, so my answer generally for that question is Bitcoin. But then if we if we look at contrarian viewpoint in Bitcoin, so th there's be two, and they might not be super contrarian, but they are a little bit is number one is I think a lot of people talk about Bitcoin's uh, superiority as a store of value being, you know, it's the most important feature. And I, I would agree with that to a certain extent, but I think people underestimate the Bitcoin's important as a, as a medium of exchange. Now, let me define medium of exchange first, because when people think medium of exchange, they immediately apply uh, transactional throughput in their mind's eye. Like they think of medium exchange and they think, oh, well, Bitcoin's a shit medium of exchange because it only does seven trades per second. It's like, no, 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 you have completely misunderstood the meaning of medium of exchange. The, the actual definition of medium of exchange is the ability for two parties to transact between each other without a third party, without a third party's permission and without the ability to be censored. Nothing in the world provides that guarantee like Bitcoin. Zero, nothing. Bitcoin is a bare asset. And when you move it, it moves into somebody else's um, possession as a bare asset. That is the ultimate form of cash. That's why Bitcoin is used on dark net markets. That is why Bitcoin is used to circumvent sanctions. That is why Bitcoin is used by not only criminals, but everybody else in the world is because it is tr 
true freedom money. And that I think is so fucking important. I don't think people talk about the medium exchange function enough because Bitcoin's uncensorability is embodied in the medium exchange function of Bitcoin. Um, it is not about transactional throughput. It is about uncensorable exchange. And that is so fucking powerful. And I think if 2020 shown us anything, it's that that uncensorability is critically important to uh, a free society. And, and we kind of discussed it earlier is that, you know, human action is freedom of speech. Human action is economic action. And in order to have free economic action, you need an uncensorable medium of exchange. That's Bitcoin. So, so like that, I think is so important. And I would say it's just as important as Bitcoin's fixed supply, uninflatable nature. So I think that's one that probably a lot of people may not agree on, but I think is very true. The other one is that, um, and the, the, probably Bitcoiners would agree with me on this, but maybe the crypto community wouldn't, is that I think Bitcoin is not crypto. They share nothing, they very, very, very little in common. So for me, I think crypto in general uh, has shares a lot more in common with government fiat than it does with Bitcoin. So for me, the way I look at, so the definition of fiat is something that is issued on and its, uh, its value is almost decreed. It's like, you know, we dictate that this is the tender for our jurisdiction, you know, and we have the monopoly to create as much as we want. And we have the monopoly on dictating what the rules of money that we issued are. So that's fiat. And that's what Bitcoin is fighting against. Bitcoin is saying that, hey, no institution, no government, no bank, no organization should have the right to have a monopoly on money. Now, what a lot of these crypto, what every crypto idiot comes out there and says is that, look, you know, Bitcoin's slow or whatever other stupid, you know, uh, unfounded criticism they have of it. And they say, oh, government bad, Bitcoin slow. I'm going to build my own crypto and I'll issue my own money. So I'm going to have a monopoly on money within this economic network. So they literally copy the play of fiat, of government fiat, but they make it a digital form of fiat. Um, and then they try and use uh, sprinklings of the of the Bitcoin uh, narrative, like, oh, it's a blockchain. Oh, it's a fucking, you know, you store your keys. And so, so they're sort of, it's kind of like a bastardized version of both in a sense. But it's like because of its very nature being issued by an organization or institution or foundation or whatever. And the fact that the rules are by decree. Now, unlike Bitcoin's rules, they're, they're just, they're, they're they're not run by anyone. They are fucking rules. Like, you know, that they that nobody can change them. Whereas everything else, somebody or something runs it and can change it. Fiat, Bitcoin. So, so I I make the argument that Bitcoin's nothing like crypto in its raison d'être. Maybe you know one could argue from a technological standpoint the similarities obviously between Bitcoin and Ethereum. So then there is between Ethereum and fiat money. But in its reason data, like in its reason for existence, Ethereum is far more like central bank money than Bitcoin is. And I think that's a very important distinction that most people miss when they try and equate Bitcoin and crypto together. So I think they're probably my two beliefs that, you know, one in the Bitcoin space may not be shared very widely. And the other one in the crypto space is definitely not shared very widely because people try and equate Bitcoin with all the rest of the fucking cryptos, which it's got nothing in common with. Hey, do you know what a unit step function is? Zero to one unit step function. It goes from like zero to like one, you know, it's mm -hmm. like a, it's like a mm -hmm. zero to one. That's, that's what I think of when I think of Bitcoin is again, I think you mentioned zero to one earlier too, but like it, to me, it represented like a true, like you said, from first principles, ground up innovation that the world needed. Whereas everything that came before it and after it doesn't. Like Litecoin, let's stop picking on Ethereum. Litecoin, three variables, three mm. effing variables the guy changed and he's calling it, you know, silver to gold, Bitcoin, whatever. It's like, ah, get me out. So I, I, I've been kind of following all this stuff and I, I you know, studied engineering yeah. too. And, and uh, you know, I'm not amazing at math, but good enough to know that, that, that there are a lot of hucksters in this space. So, um, okay, Alex, what's... Uh, I think we're kind of uh, inching up to the end. Just two quick questions. Do you have any feelings or thoughts or anything around two topics? One is AI and the second is Ubi. I'm not a socialist, not a communist. 
I just think it's a topic that's like, and they kind of feed off of each other, right? I mean, if you go far into the future, right? Because AI, blah, blah, blah. But do you have any, just any thoughts? Yep. Some people yep. just pass on it completely, but I just, I think about it some, so I, I ask people about it. No, I do. Yeah, I do. I think, I think Peter Thiel, I'll bring him up again. He has a good framing here. Sort of AI is kind of the, the, the communist dream and Bitcoin's kind of libertarian dream, right? And, you know, they're both manifesting at the same time. It's like, the, the communist or the collectivist dream idea that we can run everything centrally and make all decisions for, from a central point for everybody. Now, one of the promises of AI is that, you know, you don't have to decide anything anymore. You just sort of like pass on your personal agency, your personal decision-making capacity to something or to someone or something else. And, and I think, you know, whilst rudimentary AI, things like machine learning, et cetera, are useful because, you know, we can gain efficiencies in rote tasks, um, you know, maybe some more advanced versions of AI can, you know, do more creative tasks, et cetera. But I think it's a, without, like the, the way that, that AI is being pursued, particularly by nation states and maybe large sort of technocratic organizations is, they, they look at it as the key to unlock some utopian vision without adequately understanding that in the process of unlocking this utopian vision, uh, we may obsolete uh, um, humanity in the process. And that's a very real and dangerous threat along the way. It's like, you know, I, I read a recent article, it's actually a follow-up to Rise of the Individual Fall of the State. So it's called um, Utopian Dystopias. So it's my follow-up article. Uh, and it was, I did it right at the end of 2020. So it's pretty fresh. And in there, I talk about, I take from a first principle standpoint, you know, the decisions we're making and the fact that, you know, a lot of people think that dystopias just arise because evil people claim power. And I'm like, well, no, no, no. Dystopias actually arise because we have naive people that think, A, that a utopia can exist and B, that their, their version of utopia is the version. So then what they do is they try and homogenize society around what their vision of a final end state is. And we've seen the ramifications of that. Stalin's utopia killed you know, tens of millions of people. Hitler's utopia killed millions of people. Every single crazy motherfucker's version of a utopia started as some sort of dream or desire to fix you know, suffering or whatever the case might be. And in the process, impose their will on others. It's a very dangerous, like, I think AI represents the modern incarnation of that, is that we can somehow, uh, you know, offboard all of our problems to some sort of central processing unit that will figure it all out for us. And we're going to live blue lives. We're all happy and all this sort of shit. And I don't think we get out of it that easy. So I don't like... I think it's a very dangerous path to be on. And I think Peter Thiel's framing is really accurate in that sense is that, you know, the, the reason why, for example, the, the communist, the Chinese communist party is really, 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 really invested in trying to figure out an AI is because they are trying to centrally plan. They want to do everything from the center and, you know, some sort of AI could assist dramatically with that, but, in the process, they may make themselves fucking obsolete and, you know, wipe us all out, which is really dangerous. Like, you know, the, if, you, if you're familiar with like, uh, you know, the, the Fermi paradox and the, the great filter. So I, you know, society is advancing and then, you know, reaching the great filter, which is the point at which we destroy ourselves is, you know, do we, do we, in this article, I basically pull up two points is this utopian vision particularly now because we're so technologically advanced, could end up destroying us in two ways. One is we either nuke ourselves out of stupidity. So we chuck a, basically a communist, uh, we, we chuck a communist USR, but on a larger, you know, scale. So, you know, the, the commies blew themselves up with, um, with Chernobyl because sheer collectivist incompetence. You know, we either do that here or actually obsolete ourselves and wipe ourselves out by creating something that we completely don't understand. And I think that's a very real danger when, you know, the, the race is for power, not for, um, you know, understanding ethics or morality and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's, that's my thoughts on the, the AI stuff.
I think it's um, you know, if you're playing with fire, you better understand it. And I think that is the you know that that is a, that is the biggest fire we've played with to date. UBI is another one as well. So uh, UBI is a tough one. It's, I think it's inevitable. So despite what my thoughts on it are, I think it's going to happen. The reason being, and me, myself and Jeff Lewis had a really good discussion about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the reason I, I would argue that it's 100% coming is that the, the fact that our economy is no longer real, you know, that, that the real economy has been broken, right? Like we, we have fake economies at the moment, like Wall Street is at all time highs and, you know, Main Street is down 30, 40% in product. Like everyone's broke. We're all at home eating fast food, watching fucking Netflix and speaking to each other. Like, the, the, you know, the real economy is contracted, but on paper, there's apparently all this new wealth. So what that's doing, that, that's obviously a function, that's the Cantillon effect function, right? It's that money gets produced and it goes to the banks first and the banks sort of distribute it to where they distribute it to public companies first. And we get this asset price inflation whilst real wealth is being decimated by lockdowns and other stupid draconian mandates. So society is being torn apart. Now, there is going to be people screaming and yelling about what about us? You know, you you're giving Boeing $50 billion, but you're giving us some easily $600. People are freaking the fuck out. So what's going to happen is people's demands are going to need to be met by some politician. And all that's going to happen is the money printing is going to continue. But instead of maybe all of it just going from central bank to bank to Wall Street, a component of it is necessarily just going to get helicoptered straight to individuals to appease us just enough. Like it'll be like, okay, instead of two grand in total, let's give everyone 10 grand or something, you know, per annum. Just enough to keep people quiet, you know, just so that they're not fucking revolting. Now, where does that money come from? Most people are gonna say, thank you for fuck. As long as I get it, I can go out and spend things. Now, in theory, that sounds okay. The problem starts to arise, like the downstream effect of this is a couple things. One is that goods and services are going to continue to inflate. Like when you're adding extra money to the system, people, you know, the prices are naturally going to rise. So that, that you know, the, the use is not very effective. So we might start at 10 grand per annum. We're going to have to raise it to 15. We're going to have to raise it to 20 until someone's going to ask the questions like, why don't we just fucking give everyone a million dollars a year and be done with it? And that's sort of where we start entering hyperinflation, right? So like always, always like make fun of people who talk about minimum wage they're like oh minimum wage like, let's raise it in dollars and i'm like well if that was the answer why don't you just raise the minimum wage to a hundred dollars an hour then we'll all be rich it's like the logic doesn't work you can't just raise you can't just give someone something for free because that, that nothing more has been produced that doesn't actually map back to an increase in productivity it's just fake so, so this is what these crazy bureaucrats don't get so ubi is going to just create a bunch of fake money it's going to drive us towards uh, hyperinflation, but I think the other thing that um, represents is actually the. Um, I'm going to make up a word now: the 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 sludgeification of humanity. And what that means is people who may have traditionally had some sort of desire or inspiration to go and do something with themselves decide not to do it because they're like, "Why should I work? Fucking, I'm just." going to get taxed because you know it's, this ubi has to be paid from somewhere right so obviously working is going to get raped so they're going to be like well, why the fuck should i work because the, di the difference between me working uh 40 hours a week and working zero hours a week you know is like only a certain amount i'll just laze around and do nothing fuck it i'll just be a parasite i'll be a leech on society and i think what it does is it raises the incentive for more people to make that decision now that is actually a perfectly rational decision like if you don't have to work, why the fuck would you work? Just go out and party, take drugs, you know, drink, be fat, like watch Netflix. Do, you don't have to fucking do anything. And I think the like whilst the intent with UBI may be good, I, I fear that it will create like a this homogenous sludge 
uh, generation of human beings who, you know, genuinely either don't want to do anything or just don't have the incentive to do anything. And, and I don't know what that looks like, I don't know what the long term ramifications of that are. So I think they're both. One's playing higher and the other one is playing with um, with human desire. And I think they're both really, really dangerous and unfounded, but potentially inevitable. So I don't know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're very interesting, man. Hey, Alex, uh, by the way, I feel like I could talk to you forever. Uh, you know, we should, we should on a follow-up one, maybe get our internet uh, a little bit more fixed up. I'm not sure if it's on my side, your side, but I'd love to do mm-hmm. a more back and forth, uh, whatever, next week, next month, next year, whenever you're free. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, where do people kind of go down the rabbit hole, you know, in terms of your, your flow of consciousness? Uh, I know you write really well on, on Medium and Twitter. <laughs> so what, where are the places that people can, you know, kind of plug in? I think the the most recent one that I've started is um, what do you call it? Uh, I've started a, a podcast called Wake Up, so it's it's on Anchor. But if you, if you jump on my Twitter, you'll find it there. So you know, I, I guess my Twitter is my more abrasive, like you know, rage filled, angry version of Alex. Like you know, 160 <laughs> characters of me just blasting somebody. So if you want to have a laugh, jump on Twitter. Um, it's hilarious. My medium is my much more well thought out, you know, essays, philosophies, just really thinking about this stuff. So that's uh, svetsky.medium.com. All my stuff's on there. Yeah, the podcast is kind of in between. So like I, I, I do I do get into really deep philosophical discussions on the podcast. So I think, you know, that's definitely worth listen. And then I've recently also jumped on Clubhouse. Uh, so it's just at Svetsky on Clubhouse. Sweet. And yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's going to be an interesting platform. We'll see where that goes. So yeah. Yeah, I think that 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 seems, that platform seems like it's almost designed for people like you and I. Um, I'm having a yeah, lot of fun yeah. with it. <laughs> it's a little bit too much fun. Today I was literally in a meeting, like on one headphone, and my other headphone was on Clubhouse, and I was like, I was like, what am I doing? Like, this is not me right now. I should be focused. I gotta meditate. I gotta, you know, get. Oh my god, it was terrible. Too much input, but, man. Uh, too much input. <laughs> Too much input. Yeah, I know. I was like, I'm not doing either of these well right now. So anyways, um, but but it is a fascinating platform. Well, Alex, thanks, man. I really appreciate it, buddy. This has been fantastic. And uh, like I said, we could we could do it again soon whenever uh, whenever your schedule permits. Uh, with that, just stick around for a second. I'm going to kill this recording. Any any last words of wisdom? Any Anything else? Are we good? No, nah, man, I, I just really appreciate coming on. Like uh, th- these kind of discussions to me are really important because we, you know, we can dig into ideas. And I think I mean, this is this is the manifestation of freedom of speech, right? Is we're talking about shit that some people might find taboo, but we're in the process of discussing it. We're learning something. So I hope that everyone who's been listening to this has learned something. And yeah, thank you, Sonny, for for running this man. It's really no, cool. no problem, man. Hey, I, I gotta say though, I do appreciate you, Alex. You know, you just being so open and uh, and vulnerable as well. You shared a lot of stories that uh, you know I think people uh, will, will resonate with them because. I think on the internet, like, you know, like you said, Twitter or whatever medium, sometimes people get this image of us that we're like these perfect human like beings and mm. we know everything. And the reality is, is we've just kind of, you know, we've learned through experience or whatever it is. Right. So, so thanks for sharing that. Uh, love it. I'm going to kill this recording and just stick around for 30 seconds.